What's up, YouTube? I wanted to weigh in on the power building debate because as a recovering power builder who has since found a way to pursue both size and strength at the same time more effectively, I think I've got a useful perspective to share. But before I do that, I'm posting this on YouTube instead of Instagram because I've been getting a lot of comments on my essays asking if I could do some of my long form content as videos instead of essays. So if you like this style of content, please make sure you like, subscribe, leave a comment, do a little thing with a bell and all the other steps that you actually have to do to see somebody's video on YouTube that all the uh, YouTube creators ask for before they promote the Ray Channel Legends. Just like do all that stuff for me if you want to see more of this, okay? Uh, now I know I'm on a different platform than I usually am and of course YouTube is a little bit more visual, a little bit more attention oriented, not quite as intellectual as uh, Instagram. So I know I'm going to have to you know, flex a little bit, give you guys some quick visuals to keep the attention. I can't just expect the you know, merit of my ideas to um, go over as well as on a platform like uh, like Instagram. So here's the, the tricep for, for the attention span. Okay, so this whole power building debate started when Natural Hypertrophy released a video calling power building an abomination, which I thought was hilarious. I love how he just uses inflammatory language and just riles people up. I think it's just wonderful and charming. I might not find it so charming if I actually lived in France and people were rioting every day, but I like it. Anyway, it may seem strange that as somebody who likes strength as much as I do, I am um, in, in agreement with somebody who is kind of ideologically opposed to any sort of function and is a hypertrophy purist. But honestly, I agreed with pretty much everything he said in the video. I think he did a great job of isolating the exact com concept that needed to be attacked and you know attacking it without doing any collateral damage to any concepts that didn't need to be attacked. So I'm not going to really weigh in too much on the theory of why power building doesn't work. I think that's been established so far. I will briefly share my experiences as a recovering power builder. It won't be all that novel. It's gonna sound a lot like the stories of a lot of other people you've heard, like basement bodybuilding, but I'll, I'll go ahead and share that and then I'll share what I found that works better. Before I go into my own experiences with power building, I briefly want to touch on why I think it's important that we have good information in place about how to pursue both size and strength because I do think that's a goal that a lot of people have. I think this may be something that uh, natural hypertrophy and basement bodybuilding are overlooking. They're, they may be assuming that more people are purely interested in aesthetics than is really the case. I think, you know, first of all, we value aesthetics because the appearance of muscularity um, conveys the impression of capabilities. You know, this is not a characteristic we picked arbitrarily. There's, you know, the whole reason why we value muscularity in the first place is because it conveys the image of strength. It's only reasonable that people would want to actually have the capabilities that come with that. You know, if, if you're buying a car, most people don't buy a car that purely looks fast but isn't fast, or uh, or rather they don't want to. They don't want a car that purely looks fast but isn't fast, or one that actually is fast but looks slow. You know, most people want a car that looks fast and is fast, a good looking car that can perform well, ideally, you know, if they can afford it, right? And I think the same is true physically. And I think this is especially important given that this debate is going on mostly in natural bodybuilding, noble natty circles. We're trying to keep people off drugs. We're trying to make people optimistic about what they can achieve naturally. You know, we're, we're trying to, you know, show people how far that they can go without have, ever having to resort to that sort of thing. And if you're only focusing on one dimension of that, purely what you can look like, you're leaving so much on the table in terms of what people can do that they can be proud of. Um, so if we're not, if we're not also showing people how they can develop extremely impressive physical capabilities, I think we're doing them a disservice if we're making it seem like, you know, the only way to go is to purely focus on bodybuilding or, you know, or else you'll be strength coping or something like that. And I'm not saying they said that in these videos, um, but I think one of the most white-pilling, most positive things about what naturals are capable of, you know, is the performance that naturals can achieve when they train for it. I mean, if you look, I like to look back to the bronze era greats and just the phenomenal things that they were capable of when, you know, drugs had never been invented. Um, I think if we're trying to show people a positive vision of what naturals can achieve, if strength is not in that equation. I think we're just not presenting nearly as positive and uplifting a perspective as we could. So that's why I think, well, yes, it's important to point out that power building is probably not the way to go. I think rather than saying pure bodybuilding is the way to go, we should make it clear that there are also ways to do both, you know, and that's 
that's where I'm going to try to come in and share my perspective. And there are other perspectives too, but this is mine. So now I'll get into my experience. So for the majority of my training career, I trained in a style that can be described as powerlifting, training for both size and strength with a heavy emphasis on the big three, especially the one rep max and you know other compounds and assistance lifts thrown in but maybe sometimes it's kind of an afterthought certainly not with quite the same degree of focus and emphasis right and i have to admit it worked pretty well for the first four years i made good size gains good strength gains um, until that stopped i basically plateaued and then made no more progress for years and years and years and the place where i was at was not bad you know most people would say that i had a muscular physique. I was I obviously lifted. I looked good. I was known as kind of the big guy in most friend groups. Um, you know, most people would look at me and say, oh yeah, you should be happy with yourself. If you don't like where you're at, you know, you just have body dysmorphia because social media has shown you unrealistic images or what have you. And I didn't hate myself or anything like that. I didn't have self-loathing or start cutting myself or anything like that. It was just a little bit underwhelming to have put in all that work and really not be quite that exceptional. And same thing with strength. I had good numbers. I got up to a 385 touch and go bench, a 500 uh, low bar back squat, and a 600 conventional deadlift, which, you know, are fine lifts. Nothing wrong with that. Just a little bit underwhelming, you know. Like Basement Bodybuilding brought up in his response, there are a lot more people than we like to admit who aren't just happy with good or something we should be happy with that, you know, maybe you're not necessarily going to go on steroids or go compete in something, but still want to be more than just good, want to be exceptional in some way. Um, and I think that's a very underserved niche in today's fitness market, and I was certainly one of those people. And that's a big part of why I'm making this video and the others that I do, because I think that niche is extremely underserved. And I think there are a lot of people that, you know, could be a lot more exceptional than they are without doing anything crazy. Yes, that's you know, a lot of why I'm doing this. But anyway, so, Let's look back at that. You know, I'm not saying that squat, bench, and deadlift don't work because obviously they did for me up to a certain point, but I think with any three exercises you pick, it doesn't have to be those three, any exercises you pick, uh, focusing on them beyond a certain point, most of your gains are gonna be from you know, practice, specialization, and peaking, and you're not gonna be making a whole lot more generalizable gains or physique gains, things of that nature, right? So I'm not saying the big three don't work, I'm saying focusing on them for like a long lifting career is not going to get you anything very far. Anyway, so to continue my story, I stayed in that loop of just, you know, kind of reaching a peak on the exercises, falling off, trying to get back to it, never really making any stable progress for years and years and years, no progress, no muscular gains whatsoever, until a thing happened about three years ago. I'm not gonna say what it is because I don't want any issues with this video, but you guys know what I'm talking about. And this thing closed down the gym, so, now I could not train in that power bit in that uh, power building style. I had to just train with a barbell and some plates at home, and that changed up my training, broke me out of that cycle, and suddenly I started making gains again. So, you know, if um, <laughs> if if losing access to all gym equipment causes somebody to go from making zero gains for years and years and years to 13 pounds in the next three years of muscle, solid muscle added, you know, by losing gym equipment, that's, that may be a sign that that way that he was training previously um, leads to stagnation, you know? So now I'm gonna go into what I learned and what I started doing differently that allowed me to pursue both size and strength at the same time effectively. So obviously I made a ton of changes when transitioning from a power building style of training in a gym environment to a more minimalist uh, level of equipment, but actually more maximalist training style at home. I'm gonna leave out all of that that's not directly relevant to training for size and strength at the same time. So here's what I've settled on that works really well. I still put a lot of heavy emphasis on um, big compound lifts, including some that people would traditionally associate a lot more with strength training than with hypertrophy training. Um, but what I do is I usually use a bodybuilding type rep range and I'm not saying that there's one rep range that only stimulates hypertrophy and one rep range that only stimulates strength. I don't know if that's really true, but what I will say from a practical standpoint is that when you're training, you know, very low reps, it's a lot easier to miss lifts, miss reps, and completely throw off the momentum, um, that you really need to make a bulk work effectively, whereas it's a lot easier to just 
get the plan reps and make things work and keep your progression growing strong and just keep the momentum going that you need to actually build mass effectively in the bodybuilding rep range. So whether it's actually some physiological thing going on where, you know, one rep range works better for one thing, I don't know. But um, just from a practical standpoint, that tends to work best. Um, depending on the exercise, some exercises don't lend themselves as well to higher reps. Some don't lend themselves as well lower reps, but in general, I use a high and more bodybuilding oriented rep range. And I tend to take even the big compounds close or to failure, depending on you know what's safe and what makes sense in that lift. If it's a back squat, for example, I'm not gonna try to actually fail on every single back squat. Uh, I don't wanna have to dive out from under a bar each time. But if it's a Zercher squat, I might actually take it to failure because it's fairly safe and easy to just dump to the front. So. I, I am shooting to go to either, if not failure, zero reps in reserve, or whatever, just whatever makes sense, given given that lift, but fairly close to failure, whereas I think a lot of people training for strength with big compounds are going to be leaving a lot in the tanks that they can kind of practice technique. I don't do that. I'm not trying to practice a technique um, that's going to let me max out more effectively. I'm trying to stimulate the muscle, so I'm trying to kind of give it all in that set. Um, I do tend to do a little bit lower volume as well. A lot of times I'll take one set to failure if it's kind of a big, a big compound that um, probably can't take too many sets to failure. And I'll, I'll take one set to failure and then just distribute my volume across multiple lifts. So, you know, just if I was doing this, just, let's take an example. If I'm doing heavy zercher squats, I might, I might do one all out set of 10 or 11 or whatever the case may be, take that to failure. And then rather than try to get another set of zercher squats, I'll just get the rest of my volume in you know, sissy squats or, you know, something else, you know, if I'm doing quads, like, you know, whatever, reverse Nordic, something that um, is completely unrelated and just get volume throughout a number of exercises, you know, finish off with lunges or, you know, whatever the case may be, I'll distribute my volume through. Um, I think more lifts that I'm taking more seriously, like a lot of people will have a strong divide between this is my back squat, that's my, you know, that's my liver die exercise. That's a serious one. I'm going to take that seriously. Everything else is in accessories. Whereas for me, it would be like one set to failure of a compound, but then I'm doing the next exercise and I'm taking that just as seriously, trying to take that to failure, um, if that makes any sense. So I'm, I'm distributing my effort, I think, a little bit better among a greater variety of exercises. And I think that's been very helpful. Um, now I've talked about compounds so far. I do use those. Obviously that's, that's good for increasing strength. And on that note, I think what I do definitely does increase strength, you know, just because I'm not peaking my one rep max doesn't mean I'm not getting stronger when I'm going from being able to do something for a set of 15 to something for a set of 20, right? If, I mean, I, if I take my search or deadlift from, you know, 15 reps at a given weight to 20 reps, I still got stronger, you know, just because it's not one rep max doesn't mean it's not strength. And you, you know, you, you can see that translating over to other exercises. Um, but anyway, um, I've talked about the compounds a lot, but I've also started doing a lot of isolations and taking them just as seriously. In fact, I actually have like dedicated arm workouts, dedicated forearm workouts, dedicated calf workouts, dedicated neck workout, I'm trying to get the neck see I'm trying to get the neck growing a little bit more um, and I, I like doing that for two reasons one um, it allows me to save time I can fit those smaller groups in a lot of times in time blocks I couldn't get a whole like compound focused um, you know, back or leg workout right but I can get the smaller muscle groups done in time time blocks that I just wouldn't be able to utilize otherwise but the real benefit to doing that this really goes into one of the weaknesses of power building is just psychological. You know, if you're putting those, if you're putting those uh, muscle groups in on a day when you have, you know, some kind of a big compound or, or whatever else the case may be, um, you're not as dependent on those exercises to get a good workout. You know, let's say you, you know, you have a great, um, a great squat workout or, you know, you hit some good numbers that you're happy with on your back squats and then you go do calves. You're not dependent on your calf workout to walk out of the gym feeling like you got a good workout. If you go into the gym, all you're doing is calves. You're not going to get a good workout unless you get a good calf workout. So that makes that puts a lot more of your focus on 
yes, intensity and just execution, but also just experimenting. Because what I'm doing for calves, I'm not doing just standing calf races. I'm doing different stuff that works better. I think if I was just doing standing calf races, I'd still be eating nowhere, you know, but I had, I had to figure out some stuff that actually works. So yes, put a lot of intensity into it. I do put a lot of intensity into it, but I had to experiment until I found something that actually like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm getting a good workout. I'm sore for five days. I can see that things are happening. Um, and you may not be as incentivized to put that level of focus into it if you're not, um, if you have something else that you're feeling good about in that workout, you know, same thing. I think it really encourages you to just experiment and figure out what's going to let you get a really good workout for that particular body part. And, you know, in all the cases that I mentioned, you know, those areas are growing. And I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of coming in treating it just the same way. I kind of have, you know, there are a, lot, a lot of times there'll be one exercise that um, kind of, fills the role maybe that one of your big compounds would where I'm like really focused on, you know, my performance and, um, you know, getting my weights up, not, not trying to force it too much. Cause obviously these are small muscle groups. You can't always add weight each time, but I'm trying to get more reps. I'm trying to, you know, really focus on it, but then, you know, just experimenting and finding what, you know, feels like it's working, what's getting me sore, what's, what can I just feel the muscle working with? And just, um, you, know, you, you get so much more focus when, you are completely reliant on just training that one muscle group to um, feel like you actually had a good workout, right? So I'll, you know, I'll, I'll still have obviously my heavy back days, um, which will be more compound oriented. I'll still have, you know, heavy leg days, heavy, you know, chest, uh, shoulders, and you know, obviously the compounds are going to come into play heavily there. But I'm also doing isolation or you know, smaller body part days, and those are getting just as much focus and emphasis. Um, and so basically from that, I've been getting demonstrably stronger. Um, the cool thing about it is I'm hitting PRs on a lot of lifts that I'm not really training all that much, you know, like I'll, I'll train capabilities that are used in those lifts and other exercises. And then I'll come back and just hit a, a random PR on something that I haven't really been practicing much at all. And I see that as so much more valuable than the kind of, um, you know, peaked one rep max that I used to be getting where I just, I'd be building up, building up, building up, building up. And, you know, after so much practice, you know, I hit something good on bench press or deadlift or whatever. Um, you know, PRs like that where I feel like I'm peaking, I almost... I don't see them as, as valuable because I know like that's not really representative of what I of what I can do. That's not really translating to anything else. Like I I work up to this one rep max on my conventional. It's not necessarily going to show in any of my other lifts. Whereas now I'm seeing so much synergy. I'll just you know getting getting good at one thing will lead to something that shares that shares some capabilities just going up automatically. And I hit a new one rep max, you know, without even having practiced that. And I. I see the kind of no or minimal practice PRs that I'm hitting now. It's just so much more valuable. And I almost like if I had to, to really practice and peak up on something, I would almost see that PR as being a little bit lesser now. And that's, that's my current attitude. And it's working so well. I mean, so many of the PRs that I've hit recently have, have been like that where, you know, something else was building the capabilities, which just translated into, you know, a PR and that, um, and, you know, add to that, that I'm, you know, I'm distributing my ego investment in a greater diversity of lifts. That means that I have to develop a broader variety of capabilities to do well on those lifts. But it also means I'm, you know, I'm just not as focused on, okay, this, you know, this one lift has to satisfy my ego for like the next 10 years. You're, you're going to hit diminishing returns and get nowhere. Whereas, you know, I've got, um, you know, I, I have that more distributed, so I'm you know, putting my attention into a lot more different places, developing a lot more areas. So, at, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still getting my, I'm, my strength is still increasing. My, I'm hitting numbers that I like that make me feel good. But at the same time, I can look at my physique and I can see where I'm, you know, increasing size, you know, and those, you know, size gains are accompanied by strength. And it's just, it's just working really well. So I can talk about this stuff all day. I love talking about training, but you guys get the idea. One more thing I want to touch on before I go is how I've been using bulking and cutting to train for both hypertrophy and function simultaneously. 
So when I'm bulking, when I'm eating a calorie surplus, I try to keep my training very focused on that goal, everything directed at hypertrophy, you know, getting the rep PRs, getting the consistency, not doing a whole lot of ego lifting or anything that wouldn't be conducive to that goal. I try to be pretty disciplined there and just focus on muscular size, right? But when I'm cutting, that's when I try to train a lot of capabilities that don't necessarily require a calorie surplus, you know? So I actually do train for strength more. I actually do max out on things more because I found that my strength actually doesn't go down that much when I cut, except for on bench press and strict press, which I'm not doing much of now anyway, but it's not really affected on anything else. So that's a perfect time to actually train in those lower rep ranges a little bit more. I also experiment with new lifts to try to build out my toolbox, you know, work on new exercises that I can bring into play the next bulk if they actually do work well. But most importantly, I use that time when I'm in a calorie deficit to build my mobility. And especially this year, um, I worked with Lucas of Range of Strength and massively increased my range of motion. And that's already paid a ton of dividends on this bulk. You know, a lot of my lifts have gone up, my joint health has improved, I'm able to implement exercises that I wasn't able to previously implement because my joint health wasn't as good or, you know, my range of motion wasn't as good. So my functional strength, you know, my ability to just do stuff um, and, you know, my gym strength as well has gone up, you know, just because I'm using that time when I'm not in a calorie uh, surplus and I'm not going to build muscle anyway productively. And that's some low hanging fruit that I think almost all bodybuilders are leaving on the table. You know, if you're just training in that hyper hypertrophy style, when you're not going to be building any muscle anyway, you're wasting time. Why not at least build some kind of function, some kind of strength, you know, with that time and you can, you know, there's nothing to stop you. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the final piece of the puzzle that's allowed me to train for both while by just, you know, taking the time when I can't train for the hypertrophy anyway, to train for all the other stuff. Anyway, that's, that's just one way of doing it. Obviously there are a lot of other ways that people can, uh, train for strength and train for size at the same time. Bald Omni Man had a great video on this as well, and his style might be a lot more um, uh, favorable for a lot of people. You know, he, while I've branched out into a bunch of unusual lifts people haven't seen as much, he is a lot better at um, taking lifts that you may be familiar with but may not have worked as well for you and figuring out ways to make them work. And, you know, like I have some kind of unusual displays of strength. He's out there doing easy, super strict rows with 315, which my hat's off to him. That's tremendously impressive. So I'm not saying I'm the only one who's ever figured anything like this out. You know, there are other options, some of which are a lot more conventional, like Bald Omni Man, you know, Alex Leonidas, certainly Hersoviak, you know, all these guys combine size and strength. Um, you don't necessarily have to go out into super esoteric lifts to do that, although certainly in some of them, I think there's a lot of benefit as well. But, you know, in all cases, you're seeing people that are not just focusing on three lifts, but are expressing their strength through a variety of lifts, through a variety of rep ranges, and that's working a lot better to promote both size and strength, you know, than just focusing on peaking the big three. So that's really what the, you know, the point of this video is. You know, you can find your own way, but um, I just wanted to share my experience with it in the hopes that it helps some people go from where I was at the end of my power building phase, which was, you know, decently strong, but not anything to write home about in terms of strength. Um, and also not at all anything to uh, write home about in terms of physique. You know, my physique has definitely improved a lot since then. You can look at the back picture that I'm going to put on the thumbnail. I would not have posted my back at that time at all. Um, yeah, you know, again, I'm, not, I'm certainly not the best natural bodybuilder out there. I'm still trying to bring up the arms and everything, but compared to where I was, much improved. And you know, like I said, my strength wasn't noteworthy at that time either. And now, you know, it's very noteworthy. I would say, you know, so just another perspective on this and how you know, if you are one of those people out there, and I think there's a lot of you who want to be both strong and big and aesthetic, you can totally do that. You know, you just have to break that fixation on three lifts. All right. Thanks for watching.